Hello, beauties and beasties out there. Welcome to the next episode of Beauties and Beasts, the podcast for all things beauty and the beast. So in past episodes, we've been focusing mostly on traditional retellings of Beauty and the Beast. Now we're going to look at a more modern approach. No, I'm not talking about Disney. We're saving that for a very special occasion. Instead, I'm talking about Disney's rival company, DreamWorks, and their 2001 movie, Shrek. And before we begin on this, I'd like to thank my patrons. First, Duskwing Dragon, my Dragon Prince patron, who selected this topic as part of his rewards package. And my new patron, uh, Satuhana, I'm so sorry if I butchered that pronunciation, my True Beauty patron. And it's good to note that, for the first time ever, I am recording an episode live with my two patrons who I've just mentioned who are listening in right now. And just to remind you that you guys can ask questions at any time in text form, and they will be answered towards the end of the episode. If you want to listen to episodes live, then you must pledge at least $10 a month so that you can gain access to the closed Skype group. I have a few other announcements, such as new rewards for patrons. From now on, all patrons, from $1 a month or more, will receive monthly e-cards from me. And patrons of $5 a month or more will receive handwritten postcards from me in the mail. Existing patrons, you will receive yours this month, just as soon as I get the new stationery in the mail. And remember that all these rewards are funded by pledges, and there may be more rewards to come once monthly pledges increase. My next goal is to not only fund these rewards, but to get a new microphone shield or foam sound so that my recordings can be of more higher quality, and so I don't have to record an hour under a very stuffy blanket to block out sound. Other patron rewards include listening to new episodes early and listening to previews. You can also buy merchandise for Beauties and Beasts on redbubble.com, as these will fund the podcast and patron rewards as well. Remember that true beauty comes from the kindness you show unto others. So, Shrek is probably one of DreamWorks' best movies ever made, in the sense that it's pretty much the movie that put DreamWorks on the map. As a worthy adversary for Disney, which pretty much has been the king of animation for several decades. Now, if you have never seen the movie Shrek, then I have to ask, what rock have you been living under? But if somehow you are one of those people, then I must say that there is a spoiler warning for this episode as major plot points will be revealed. Now, a lot of you have may have seen the movie Shrek, but what some of you may not know is that Shrek actually started out as a children's picture book in 1990 by William Steig. Now, the book is a lot different from the DreamWorks movie in the sense that, well, one, it's much shorter, and the story is slightly different. Okay, so we start off with a green, ugly creature named Shrek. He's actually not explicitly an ogre in the story. All that is said that he is uglier than his mother and his father, and he's okay with that. And then one day his parents decide that they are sick of him, and they kick him out, so that he may go out into the world and spread his ugliness and terror everywhere. And Shrek is happy with that. He enjoys scaring people with his ugliness. Like, I am ugly, and I'm proud of it. And during his scaring rampage, he meets a witch in the woods, who predicts that a talking donkey will lead him to a princess uglier than he is, a princess whom he will marry. And as you may have guessed, this happens, and Shrek defeats a very incompetent knight with fire breath, uh, oh, apparently Shrek has fire breath, who knew? Goes through a hall of mirrors, almost scaring himself before realizing it's his own reflection, and then finds the princess, who is really ugly. And she doesn't look like Shrek, she actually is more bird-like. Anyway, Shrek and the very ugly bird princess fall in love at first sight, and they get married and live horribly ever after. Yeah, this is one of the few times that the movie is actually better than the book. DreamWorks kind of took the story a step further, adding more layers to the story and the characters. But I think what this story was meant in the beginning was to be a story of self-confidence and self-image. That you should be happy with who you are, never want to change, and someday you're going to meet someone who's just like you, no matter how ugly you may appear. It's a good message to send to kids. In 2001, DreamWorks released the movie Shrek, and it was pretty much a big deal. Like I said, it made DreamWorks a worthy competitor for Disney, and it was the first winner of the new Oscar category of Best Animated Feature Film. If you're wondering why Disney didn't win that category before, it's because that category was just created that very year. Now, Shrek is kind of a big parody of Disney, and the reason behind this is that Jeffrey Katzenberg, the founder of DreamWorks, used to work for Disney. 
If you're wondering who Jeffrey Katzenberg is, well, he's kind of infamous in Disney's history. For instance, Part of Your World was almost cut out of The Little Mermaid because Jeffrey Katzenberg thought it was too boring for audiences. He thought Pocahontas was going to be a bigger hit than The Lion King. He didn't believe in The Lion King. And he's the reason that Robin Williams didn't come back for Return of Jafar, but did come back for the third Aladdin movie after Jeffrey Katzenberg was fired. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it all worked out for the best. We got awesome movies from DreamWorks like Shrek. And the movie would still be great, even if it wasn't poking fun at Disney at every turn. The movie spawned three sequels, one prequel, and a spin-off series on Netflix, a series of holiday specials, and a Broadway musical. And we're going to be talking a little bit about some of those, but first let's go to the original movie. As I've said in previous episodes, Beauty and the Beast stories tend to follow a five-act structure, and Shrek is no exception. Let's start with Act 1, the introduction to the characters. So, we start out with the classic fairy tale movie prologue of a storybook, in which you hear Shrek narrating the story of a lovely princess who is put under an enchantment, locked away in a tower guarded by a dragon, awaiting her true love and true love's first kiss. And Shrek just rips a page and laughs it off and throws the page down the toilet. And so we're fully introduced to Shrek, a big green ogre who is living alone in the swamp, and he is very happy being gross, eating slugs, and scaring off angry mobs. Meanwhile, somewhere else in the forest, we've got some fairy tale creatures who are wanted by the law. They are being carried off in sort of Inquisition style, and among those fairy tale creatures being arrested is a talking donkey named Donkey. Not very creative, but it works. As Donkey is running away from the guards, he runs into Shrek, and Shrek scares the guards off, and because of this, Donkey wants to be friends. But Shrek is incredibly annoyed by his overly enthusiastic nature and how he can't stop talking or singing. Donkey begs to stay with Shrek, and Shrek is like, nope. But then after Donkey's constant begging, Shrek gives in, okay, but only for one night, and you sleep outside. So, start off to a very rocky, long-lasting friendship. Now we go to Act 2, how the beauty comes into contact with the beast. That very same night that Donkey stays over, these fairy tale creatures show up on Shrek's swamp, and they say that they've been dumped there by Lord Farquaad, who evicted them from their home. Donkey volunteers to lead Shrek to Duloc, much to Shrek's chagrin, which is Lord Farquaad's domain. Meanwhile, we're introduced to the movie's main villain, Lord Farquaad, who is pretty much a caricature of Michael Eisner, one of the big wigs of Disney at the time. Seriously, Jeffrey Katzenberg was really not happy with Disney. And we see Farquaad, who's this dwarfish, narcissistic perfectionist, who is torturing the gingerbread man in order to find the location of the other fairy tale creatures in hiding so that he can banish them to make the kingdom a better place because, um, because... You know, his motive is not really described well in the movie. It's described better in the Broadway musical. I'll get to that later. Farquaad's knights bring in a magic mirror, and, you know, the magic mirror from Snow White. Oddly enough, looks exactly like the Disney version. Yeah, see what I mean? Jeffrey Katzenberg was really pissed at Disney. He asked the mirror, Mirror, mirror on the wall. Is this not the most perfect kingdom of them all? The magic mirror replies, Technically, you're not a king, but you can become one if you marry a princess. And the mirror tells Farquaad about Princess Fiona, who is that same princess you saw in the prologue, locked in the tower and guarded by a fire-breathing dragon. And Farquaad sees how beautiful Fiona is, and he's like, Yes, she's perfect. She'll be the perfect queen. And the mirror starts to warn him about something that happens after sunset, but Farquaad won't listen to him. He sets up a tournament for knights to go rescue the princess for him. Because, apparently, Farquaad is too lazy a uh, duke or lord or whatever he is to... Rescue the princess himself. Jesus, guy's a coward. Shrek crashes the tournament in an effort to get his swamp back, but when the knights turn on him, he just beats him up in this huge, awesome smackdown that the crowd just loves. Seeing how strong he is, Farquaad decides to send Shrek off on this heroic quest to rescue the princess, and if he does, Farquaad will give the deed to the swamp to Shrek. On the way, Shrek and Donkey are having a conversation, Donkey's asking Shrek, why do you act so nasty? And Shrek says, ogres are like onions. To be clear, as a kid, I did not get this metaphor at first. But I do get it now. 
onions having layers and ogres having layers means there's more to Shrek than meets the eye, and that's Shrek's way of telling Donkey. Though, Donkey does not get it either. You know, cakes have layers! Ogres are not like cakes, Donkey! So now we get into Act 3, actual contact between the Beauty and the Beast. Shrek and Donkey reach the castle, they run into the dragon, and the dragon turns out to be a girl dragon and falls for Donkey. And in that confusion, Shrek finds a princess, rescues her, takes her out of the castle, and Fiona wants Shrek to give her true love's kiss. And Shrek and Donkey just laugh at that. Shrek removes his helmet, and Fiona's like, okay, I'm not gonna kiss you anytime soon. And Shrek explains the whole situation to her, and pretty much just tries to carry her back to Duloc. When night falls, we learn a little bit about Shrek. As he's talking to Donkey over by the fire, he says that he's actually bothered about people judging him, even though he doesn't really show it, and that's why he shuts everybody out. If everybody sees him as a monster, he might as well just be one. What he doesn't know is that Fiona was listening at the time from the cave she was sleeping in. And in the morning, she's a little more considerate towards him, even making Shrek and Donkey breakfast. So during the road trip, we learn some unexpected things about Fiona. That she's a lot feistier than Shrek expected. That she's very burpy, knows karate, can make balloons out of real animals. And through all this, Shrek and Fiona bond because she is just as nasty as he is. And of course, everything seems happy between them, except for the lingering notion that Shrek is an ogre and she is a human princess. And besides, she is going to marry Lord Farquaad soon. And so we go into Act 4, The Betrayal. Donkey starts to see that Shrek and Fiona are digging on each other. And so when night falls, Donkey goes into the hut that Fiona is sleeping in and finds instead a large female ogre in Fiona's clothes. And we learn that Fiona is actually under a curse, that she is an ogre at night and a human by day until she finds her true love and receives true love's first kiss and then takes true love's form. Meanwhile, outside of the abandoned hut, Shrek has a sunflower and is about to confess his love to Fiona. However, he overhears Fiona say to Donkey, Who can love a hideous beast? And he thinks that she is talking about him. And so morning, there's this whole misunderstanding. When Fiona is human again, she decides to tell Shrek everything. But Shrek is mad. You know, who can love a hideous, ugly beast? And Fiona thinks... He knows about the curse, and he doesn't want to be with a monster. Though she's like, but I thought that wouldn't matter to you. Yeah, well, it does. See, this is why communication is important. So Farquaad arrives, and despite Fiona being a little weirded out by the difference in height, she accepts his proposal. Mostly in spite of how Shrek hurt her, even though unintentionally, and because she had unintentionally hurt him, and... Jeez, okay, this all could have been avoided if you guys just talked things out a whole lot earlier. So as Fiona's riding off with Farquaad, Shrek pushes Donkey away, and then there's this whole sad montage with Hallelujah. And so we go to Act 5, The Resolution, where everything is sorted out. Donkey goes after Shrek, tells him that there was a misunderstanding, and they both ride Dragon, whom Donkey had found during his moping, to crash the wedding. So they crash the wedding, Fiona's secret is exposed, Farquaad's about to lock her up because of how hideous she is, but then Farquaad is eaten by Dragon and Dragon X Machina. Shrek and Fiona confess their love for each other, kiss, and Fiona is turned into a permanent ogre. And she's like, I don't understand, I'm supposed to be beautiful. And Shrek replies in the sweetest response you could ever get, but you are beautiful. No. So they kiss again, they get married, and they live ugly ever after. Oh yeah, and Dragon and Donkey get together too. The end! So, one of the reasons this movie became so popular and groundbreaking is because it put a nice twist to the Beauty and the Beast story. Instead of having the Beast be under a spell, it's the Beauty who is under a spell, and eventually becomes the Beast. And this shows that your ugly parts can actually be beautiful, and not just on the outside. However, there was some criticism to this ending of Fiona becoming an ogre in order for her and Shrek to be together, as this kind of implies that same has to be with same. Also, the fact that Fiona had to change herself to be with the one she loved. However, I think DreamWorks tackled this criticism in Shrek 2, which came out in 2004. Now, I'm not going to go over the whole plot of the sequel, but the gist of it is that Shrek tries to make Fiona happy by becoming a human with her. 
But we learn that Fiona is actually happy with ogre life. So I think that Fiona was always meant to be an ogre. That in becoming an ogre, she's accepting the ugly and less attractive parts of herself, which are actually an essential part of herself. And this is explored more in the musical. Yeah, the other sequels are really not worth mentioning. I mean, they're okay to watch, but they're really not as deep as the first two movies. And Puss in Boots is really just a spin-off and has nothing to do with, you know, Shrek and Fiona at all. Although the Puss in Boots Netflix spin-off show is really worth watching. Maybe I'll do a bonus episode on that someday. But something that's really worth mentioning is Shrek the Musical, which was produced on stage in 2008. The book was written by David Lindsay Aber and follows the movie plotline almost to a T, but with some differences. For one thing, there are a lot more songs. Not just jukebox songs, but you know, Broadway songs that actually help move the story forward. And more importantly, we have more backstories. For instance, in the beginning, we see Shrek sent away by his parents when he is seven. Kind of taken from the picture book, only he is much younger and out on his own, and it makes a moment a little more sympathetic. And we see flashbacks to Fiona's childhood, where she's reading storybooks to her dolls, and she sings this whole song about wanting to meet her true love, a handsome knight slash prince, because in all the books she reads, the princess in trouble marries a handsome prince. Yeah, this is why the books you read your children are important. Giving them unrealistic goals can just lead to them not getting the realistic goals that'll actually make them happy. There's even more backstory for Farquaad. We learn that he has daddy issues with Grumpy. Yeah, Grumpy, one of the seven dwarfs in Snow White, is Farquaad's dad. And he abandoned him, although actually we learned that Farquaad was actually 30 years old and living in Grumpy's basement. But anyway, he felt abandoned, so he went out to make himself bigger than he actually literally was, so that he could get back at his father. Oh yeah, and there's even more character development given to the background fairy tale creatures, especially in the awesome number Freak Flag, in which the fairy tale creatures sing about how their differences make them strong, and that is time that they stand up to Farquaad, they stop hiding what makes him special. Yeah, this song is especially great because it really ties the themes of Shrek more with minority groups, especially the LGBT community. In fact, my friend saw an off-Broadway production in which at the end of Freak Flag, everybody brought out all these pride flags. And even without that director's choice, if you listen to the lyrics, like Pinocchio saying this line, I'm what, I'm good, get used to it. It's very similar to the popular LGBT slogan, I'm here, I'm queer, get used to it. Shows you how deliberate the LGBT subtext was. And this made the musical a lot more relatable to real life, showing that differences are good, that the only thing that matters with true love is if you have something in common, and just have a real connection. You know, it doesn't matter what you look like or what backgrounds you come from, like if you are in high society or you are of the lowest of the low. All that matters is how you feel about each other and how you can relate to each other. There's also a secondary Beauty and the Beast relationship between Donkey and Dragon. And which one is the Beauty and the Beast is really up to interpretation. But they are clearly different physically and a little bit personality-wise. You don't see their relationship develop as much, but you can see that it is actually pretty strong. When Dragon and Donkey first meet, Donkey is the first to compliment her. And with Donkey talking so much, uh, few people actually listen to him, and Dragon actually does listen to him. Even though he's scared at first, uh, over time through the movie, probably after seeing how well Shrek and Fiona get along, he starts to realize, you know what, maybe me being a Donkey and her being a Dragon isn't so much of an issue. I mean, it's worth a shot, right? You see more of their relationship in the musical, especially the national tour version versus the Broadway version. The song Donkey Popeye is replaced with the song Forever. Yes, Dragon actually sings in this one. And she sings about how she feels unwanted with all the knights after Fiona. Especially with these lyrics like, You think I like this job? I'm a glorified babysitter. No one wants to rescue me, so yeah, I'm a little bitter. I'm no princess, no great beauty. No one ever, ever, ever wanted me. And then Donkey tells her, you want true love? Well, stop with the hating. Unchain your heart, he's out there waiting. And then Dragon turns her affections towards Donkey. <laughs> 
So that was probably one of DreamWorks' first of many beautiful, weird couples, and it's best not to think how the Dronky Babies in Shrek 2 came to be. It's just gonna make your head hurt. But it's still cute! So the overall message of the story Shrek and the movies and the musical is the idea that love is a weird and unpredictable thing and it can come from anywhere. And don't let others get you down for being different. It is important that you love yourself. By accepting Shrek, Fiona was able to accept herself. She was not very ladylike and her personality was considered beastly to others. But she was able to accept that part of herself by accepting who she loved and in turn able to accept that life as an ogre or a very beastly creature couldn't be so bad. All right, that's everything I have in my notes. If either of you patrons listening have any questions, I'll be taking them right now. Just put them in text form right now. These can be questions regarding the episode topic itself or just any more information about the show or the patrons. Okay, so Duskwing Dragon asks, do you script the episodes in advance or just make up the dialogue as you go? Well, kind of a little bit of both. Like, I don't just type out the full script. What I do is just I take notes on mostly stuff on plot and characters, like, you know, Act 1, Act 2, Act 3, and some little notes about my own thoughts about each topic and maybe some side comments that I want to make. Some of the side comments I just make up as I go along. But, yeah, yeah, like I plan out some of the stuff I'm going to say just to make sure that I don't forget any of my thoughts. Some of them I'll add as an afterthought. But no, the script is not really written out in full. Okay, any other questions? Okay, same person asking, This podcast focuses on fairy tale based stories. What counts as that for more modern examples if someone wants to make suggestions? Well, Shrek is clearly one example. Uh, there are some other things that I had ideas for future topics like the movie Penelope or the lesser known movie Rigoletto, also that movie Beastly, or even just, you know, smaller topics about side couples in movies and TV like. Who Framed Roger Rabbit with Jessica and Roger and Madame Vastra and Jenny in Doctor Who. Like, I mostly do Beauty and the Beast and with Beauty and the Beast couples and friendships, characters who are different either physically or personality-wise and just get into a relationship, whether platonic or familial or romantic. It, yeah, stuff like that. And because it's getting hot under this blanket, I will take one more question. Alright, so final question. So would an adaptation of Romeo and Juliet count as well? Because I know a couple of different versions of that which are different from the original. Like Boarding School Juliet, if you heard of that? Hmm. Well, I think that would be interesting. Like, if you just show me where I could find this version. But yeah, if you guys have suggestions, something like that, that maybe doesn't relate directly to Beauty and the Beast, but to some fairy tale in some way, I might consider it, like, either for a canon episode or maybe just a bonus episode, because I've been considering doing short bonus episodes for smaller topics that would be available to only patrons. But yeah, like, if you have any suggestions, just message me about them, and if you know where I can find these movies slash TV shows slash books that you're talking about, send me links so that I may look into them more. All right, so that's going to be it for this episode. Next time will be the Halloween special. And kind of an answer to your question about fairy tale based stories and what's counting as subjects. Well, Halloween, we're going to be looking into the story of Dracula, which is not really a fairy tale, but does share some Beauty and the Beast themes. Though we're specifically looking into the Bram Stoker book, the original novel, and specifically we're going to look at why this is not a Beauty and the Beast story. You will understand what I mean if you've read the book or if you'd rather just listen to the next episode. Alright, so see you all Halloween, and remember, true beauty comes from kindness, and your kindness will not go unrewarded. If you want to keep this podcast going, go become a patron right now and click on the green button in the right hand corner or follow the link in the description below and pledge at least a dollar a month and you will be funding not only this podcast, but the rewards for the patrons who fund this podcast now. All right, until next time on Halloween.